Um, I, I'm going to start because um, I'm assuming that um, the, 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 there are quite a lot of people here who don't know the play as well as those who do. You probably know it's set on a boat on some water because it's had a certain amount of publicity about that over the years, one way and another. Um, what it's also about, of course, is, um, is um, the usual um, uh, angry exchanges between... Uh, men and women, usually husbands and wives, but not always. And, um, and, and there's a lot of aggression of a, of a different sort. And I just wanted to um, deal very quickly with um, the question of whether... Because I can see Chichester's in a fever of electrical, uh, electoral excitement at the moment, isn't it? I was going, you know, passing through the town, you couldn't help noticing how many banners there are up in uh, South Street and North Street. Anyway, um, the... the um, one of the reviewers, certainly, and a number of reviewers way back in the 1980s suggested, Alan, that this was a bit of a party political on what was then the SDP, the, uh, the, um, Liberal, the Liberals about to be aligned with, um, with the right wing of the Labour Party. It never was that, was it? Never. No. <laughs> so you started with the notion of evil? Evil? Um, I started with the notion of the nature of leadership. Um, and I, I, I was looking for a sort of metaphor for leadership because it's a very grandiose notion that. And you could you get people standing in spotlights and declaiming in black leotards and tights, I am a leader. And then somebody else standing in another black leotard and tights and saying, I am a subservient worker. And I thought, no, that isn't me. Uh, and I thought one of the ways you could make the nature of leadership makes sense, is, is I spent a lot of my childhood on cabin cruises on the River Thames and the notorious Norfolk Broads, uh, which was more like a dodgem car, uh, <laughs> driving so many boats. That, um, and I thought, yes, I, I observe these boats, and there are luckless families get on them at the beginning of, of, the, uh, of the journey, <laughs> up or down some river, and uh, always, it's usually the husband. He declares himself the skipper, and he puts on a silly hat, and uh, he shouts absolutely unintelligible orders to his poor family, who re realize they're in for an absolute hell of two weeks. Uh, the poor wife often finds herself in the galley, if she's not careful, and cooking. And so what sort of holiday is that? And the kids are jumping on and off, tying up ropes, and, and the whole thing. Uh, um, and um, I thought, yes. I, and I got very curiously interested in the fact that people, often politicians, and I do get onto politics here, my theory is that if you, you grow up feeling you, you can lead people and you are destined to be a politician, you are probably dead wrong for the job. <laughs> uh, and there's the other 80% of us who, who, who grow up not wanting to start running the country are probably not bad bets, uh, but you know the wrong people tend to put themselves forward. That's the point. Uh, and uh, way upstream is a sort of metaphor of that. You know, it's, it's... Um, just before we leave that, did you not become a skipper yourself in due course in adult life? Ooh. A little bit. <laughs> I, I, Mike... have spoke, I have spoken to your sons about this. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they always remind me, you nearly killed us. They say, um, no, it's terrifying. I was talking to, 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 to someone just now, and uh, boating, if, if you have a car on the road, uh, you have to take a driving test, mm -hmm. and you have to, you know, uh, uh, observe certain codes, uh, rules of the highway. But you just get into a boat on a river, and the guy says, oh, yeah, that goes forward, and that goes backwards, and then uh, you just come across there, and it's a piece of cake. Um, and, uh, and then you're suddenly on your own. And the first thing you find about a boat is it doesn't have any brakes. <laughs> so if you're going with the current, you suddenly are hurtling towards lock gates, and you're increasing speed, and you, so you throw it into reverse, and then you're in engulfed in black smoke and the engine is straining and you, you're still going and uh, I've seen people going sideways under bridges I mean it's completely unbearable uh, and you know that I took one boat back um, and I, he said uh, yeah we're good it was host season so it was a very nice 
Norfolk Broad's family uh, phone. And he said, have, have a good trip. And I said, well, we had one or two bumps. And he said, well, you know, that's, that's, that's understandable, one or two bumps. Then he walked around the front and he went, bloody hell. <laughs> You stove half the timbers in. And I said, yeah, well, we did hit something quite heavily. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, is there a metaphor for directing in that, Nadia, do you think, in that kind of um, uh, assumption, assumption of leadership in this, um, the way that Alan's... Is... Um, you should, I mean, in contrast to Alan, you, yes. you know, you went to Goldsmiths, home of young British artists and all that kind of thing, mm. and, and you've been on the director's um, course at the National Theatre studio so you're kind of trained in a way that Alan's completely untrained that's funny you should think of me as trained I I feel that I didn't know much about theatre at all and just happened on I, I was studying French actually and I was at university in France and sort of tried to in a very bohemian way hang out with artists and dancers and then got a bursary to work um, in a theatre company here. So I didn't really know what theatre was. I had no idea what directing was, but I saw the beguiling actors in a corner and I thought, I want to be where they are. I want to be part of that. And I remember the artistic director of this theatre company saying, you'll never be a director. And I thought, right, that's it. I'm leaving my job. And I signed up to do an MA in theatre directing, not knowing what it was really. Um, but part of the course at Goldsmiths was to do a play. So actually to have a go, because you can't learn directing by talking about it. So I was no expert. I learned on the job in pub theatres, <laughs> basically. Mm. Yes. Which is kind of how you learn on the job as well. On but, the job, but yeah. But you'd, be, you'd been an actor quite a lot, hadn't you? And yeah, suffered under several directors. <laughs> um, until eventually that you get up to a point when you think, oh, I can do this. <laughs> with half the hassle. Um, you, no, I was never trained in anything. I, I, did, I left school before I went to university um, and I wasn't even trained as an actor. So I'm totally untrained and instinctive. But um, That's brilliant. I think often um, some very good actors make the best directors. I, I actually always, think slightly though. less good actors make really good directors. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> I'm the sort of actor I would never employ. <laughs> well, you were a very naughty actor, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just muck about. Making life very difficult for other new writers. I come from a come gambon on. school of performance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just... Um, I happened at one point to work with Michael Grandage quite a lot, who's element of success in the West End now. Um, and, and I realised that, I, as a critic, I once reviewed him in... Um, Edward II, in which he played the rather beautiful Piers Gaveston, because uh, he is very beautiful, Michael Gandit. And, um, and I said, oh, I saw you in that, but I can't remember a thing about it. And he said, thank God for that. Because <laughs> he was actually a very, as he would say, a very, very dull and wooden actor. But he was on stage, knowing what, knowing what it felt like um, to be in something where the audience's attention is evaporating as you speak. And... and the feeling the strong need to do something about that. And I, I think you had a bit of that, Alan, didn't you? Yeah, kind of... and I would, I'd act and check the lights and all that. You know, it, it was, it was, it's, an int it's a way in. I mean, I, I think it's more important to be an actor and then a writer, a playwright, uh, which, which um, of course, W. Shakespeare was the way that started. Um, but um, there's a lot of very successful playwrights who've, who started as, as actors, but... Um, there's one or two directors who have also started to... Um... So, so, Nadia, you, you get the job directing way upstream. What do you do then? I know nothing about boats. No, I, read, I, I, I didn't know the play. So I read the play, and as with all plays, you have an affinity you, with certain aspects, certain characters, certain relationships, and... That's what you want to make, and then you must be careful not to just make that story. But um, the, the, the marriages, the relationships, I mean, they're just fascinating to me. And, and I love it when dialogue is just so dexterous, you can hear it. Because I think, I think probably all directors have a bit of actor in them, or certainly I, can, I feel I can hear the lines in my mm -hmm. head. So it's just, it was just so, like, you can, you can just imagine people saying those lines and you can just imagine those relationships and those marriages and especially you know Keith and June who were the alpha couple let's call them and and you know those couples it's so embarrassing to be around or you've been one of those couples when you're arguing and forgetting everyone else is around it's just to me that was 
you know, straight away I could see real people and hear real people. So, yes, it's on a boat. Mm. Of course, one can't forget it's on a boat. But that was secondary to me in, when I read it. Mm. But uh, there's a line in it, not to give too much away again. I mean, somebody says a boat is a society in miniature. Well, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I think it's fascinating people, and I have people in my family that do this, choose to go on caravanning holidays, so a little home away from home. And, and I find it... I'm, I, I don't enjoy those types of holidays at all. So I find it fascinating when people just want to do a, a mini home somewhere else. And, uh, yes. Actually, going on holiday with anyone is a disastrous idea, yes. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't leave. You wreck leave. so many friendships so quickly <laughs> and then the way you get out of it, absolutely. Um, so, but then, you know, you, you, you've, you've got the domestic stuff, which has been... Um, uh, which, which Alan has demonstrated being very, very good at, at from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then, then you notice things like the river's called the River Orb and the destination is Armageddon Bridge. And you <laughs> start to think, maybe this is about something else as well. A bit of mischief <laughs> in there. Yeah. Yes, no, absolutely. I think it was so before its time, this idea that, um, you know, that I sort of know as cliches in a movie now, the bad dude gets on board and slashes everyone up. But actually, how extraordinary it must have been at the time, and still is, that this, you know, charming people can charm their way and do all my, my ex-husband, basically, into any situation. <laughs> and, you know, get him, you know, you invite the vampire in. He never just comes in. He's invited in. And the rest is up for grabs. And I think that's fascinating. And I think it's fascinating to have a, such a brilliant... Oh, God, it's going to all sound a bit... <laughs> but but um, that uh, the last quarter almost, in a way, changes genre uh, for a bit, and you just you know you're sort of, is it an it, it, it's a nightmarish horror? It's still funny. It's still domestic. Then it's heightened. I mean, it's just really full fat theatre. I mean, I just I, you know I've never read anything like it. Um, as Nadia says, there is um, a bad dude in it. Um, <laughs> Oh, actually, it said no. It doesn't say that in the program. But um, and and that bad dude, Vince Allen. You always say that all your characters come from you, Vince. Part of you? Yes, yeah, part of me. Um, writing really bad people is always fun because you, you, you there's a little bit of you that says, "Oh, I, I, I could really be evil at this point," you know. And uh, and they are very easy to write, actually. And it's a horrible thing to say, but the the, the nice characters are always very, very difficult because they, they, you have to make them... Bad people are, if you've written them well, are always attractive. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they, they, they sparkle. And, you know, you, 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 we, we are, as uh, human beings, we, we, we are attracted to glittery, basically quite evil people, I think. And, and the, 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 the nice, good people which I tend to write about as well, the Dougley speeches in Man of the Moment and those sort of people, um, tend to be less sparkly, but you, wa you, you, you want them, the audience really to, to root for them. So it's very important that you can make them somehow attractive, but it's quite hard to do. And it's extraordinarily hard to direct or play those ordinary people, I yeah, think, yeah. because it's one thing playing somebody who's so exciting and enigmatic and, you know, but the, 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 the quiet ordinariness is something, you know, some, a character that doesn't speak so much and is sort of self-deprecating, but you, you root for them and you, you're right so easily off them unless they're played with some kind of utter integrity. I mean, it's a really hard pitch. Well, you, you, you mentioned Man of the Moment and Douglas Beachy as, as this person who's been a have-a-go hero donkeys years ago, but he has nothing to say whatsoever. So that when he's, um, he's kind of gathered in for a television reunion with the, the man who had a shotgun when he last saw him in his hand and blew the face off his girlfriend, so to speak, um, the, the energy comes from the villain uh, and you need an actor somehow to invest with a kind of magnetism somebody who everybody is describing as extremely boring. <laughs> which, which is a toughie, isn't it? I yeah, mean, yeah, 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 yeah. You had Michael Gambon in the West End, which probably... Yeah, well, yes, yeah. yes, he's, yeah. he's pretty riveting. But um, it, it's quite hard to do, uh, but it, it's, it's worth it. Um, mm. And if you can pull it off, then you make your villain so obnoxious by the end and so unpleasant that people go, oh, I don't 
think I'd rather like this man anymore. And then they turn to the other man and they reach out a hand and he reaches out a hand and suddenly you're holding the right guy's hand. And um, it's, it's, not that, it's not that simplistic, one, but... You know, I, that's one I of the methods of taking over control of the boat, um, from, from the beginning, actually, this whole thing of, of, of a separate language for boating. You know, you don't... Ropes aren't called ropes on boats for some reason. They're sheets or whatever they are. And, 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 and of course, he comes in and changes all that. So the cast have actually got to learn two new languages in the course of the play in order to make it work. But language is, is really important in terms of power there. I mean, there's an, almost an Orwellian thing going on. He takes away all their names to start with. He has awful nicknames for them, lightning and cookie and, you know, um, ginger. Um, you know, he just, he just deprives them of their identity just subtly and then he takes away what they know, you know. That's not a table. No, that's a chair. Uh, and um, you have to remember that's a chair and I'm sitting on a table. And, you, you know, it's a Kafka situation, mm. <laughs> which you suddenly sign up for because uh, you've, you've voted him in. Um, and it's rather the same as you, you vote in a government who ch suddenly changes um, and they, they say, all cars have to drive sideways, you know, and, um, and you think, what? <laughs> what have we voted in? Um, but, uh, but the good people don't want to make trouble or rock the boat, as it were, because it's just ordinary people. We don't, we don't, unless pushed. And, and I think it's so English, this play. I mean, I came to this country as a child in the 80s, late 80s, and I, I, I don't know whether I can articulate, but reading that play really reminds me of England, coming to England and Britishness. And that, uh, this is going to sound a bit odd, but that sort of trying to do the right thing and being a good person, but not believing if something terrible is going on, whether we should say anything <laughs> about it. I just wondered if all the, um, the stuff about changing the language for people is also sort of highlights another particular British thing about um, the way in which you speak being so important. I don't, I'm not talking about the class thing. I'm talking about mm -hmm. the way in which you have to use exactly the right kind of code for things in order to get stuff across. And, um, and actually, the, there's quite a big challenge for actors in what appears to be a very naturalistic play to start with and then moves into, as you say, a kind of slightly different territory towards the end. Yes, it is. It is. I mean, gosh, I hope I've done it justice and pitched it right. Yeah, I mean, everybody here is going to... She said it was going to... <laughs> she said it was going to... I mean, yeah, go on. Yeah, she said this was going to happen. And yeah, it's just didn't, yeah. Really, um, but I think the sort of the writing does it for you. So we, we shouldn't, you know, we could, the actors wanted to dissect a little bit, and I'm sure people will want to, what's happening at the end of the play? Is it real? Is it a dream? Is it, the, is it a symbol for that? But you can't play that, of course. Or I don't, I think it's a mistake to. Mm. So, so uh, you have to play the, that last bit of the, in my opinion, for for real as much as possible, hmm. even if what's happening is slightly surreal. <laughs> I mean, that's my... I don't know yeah. whether that's yeah. right, I mean, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. You play, yes. We, so we didn't sit there and... You know, you have to be in it as if it's real. Hmm. And the rest, I think, takes care of itself. Yes, I mean, you're, you're not one for sort of dreamscapes, are you, in your plays? No, no, I'm a... I'm, I, 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 I'm a great... I grew up... Uh, admiring a man who was a year or two ahead of me, um, Harold Pinter, and I loved his obliqueness. And people often asked about his plays, and they say, "Well, what, what does this mean?" And he'd say, "Mind your own business." Um, and um, there's often another word between other and business. Yeah, I yeah, have yeah, to say yeah. As well, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But I, I was foolish enough to ask him as an actor what what a certain scene meant, and he just told me in that sentence. Uh, and you, you thought, oh, well, shut up, actor. Um, just get on with it. Uh, but, um, yes, I mean, you just play it. Um, let the audience draw what they see out of it, and hopefully, providing you, you're saying all the author's lines in the right order, it'll sort of happen. Um, but um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not stylized really. Then there's, there's also a bit of you, isn't there, which says... Um, I know, there's, I know one thing you really can't do in a theatre. 
set a play on a boat on water. So I'm going to do that. Such a boy to do that. And there were moments in, in rehearsal that I could see it was written by... I, I shouldn't say that, should I? But, oh, this is a man who's written this. I don't know what to do with this kedge and scuff. And I was getting really frustrated. But it became a lot of fun. And the actors... It's a very physical play. Yeah. I mean, they're exhausted by the end of it because they can't have a coffee break in the dialogue nor in the movement. Mm. And even if it's... That's what one of the actors was saying to me today. She said, we've only got this tiny boat, but that's why your moves are so precise because you're not... If you do the wrong move at the wrong time, you, you forget where you are. It's so discombobulating. So mm. it's a very physical and mentally challenging play, I think. It, it's, um, by the way, I'm going to open this up for questions from the audience any minute now, so please be ready. Um, but I, I was going to say there's also a thing that you'd, you'd love taking advantage of in the theatre, which is that if people are out of sight, but you can still hear them, there is a kind of opportunity for audience imagination to come into play, which is even greater than putting it in front of them. And if they're in, inside a cabin cruiser, where you know conditions are incredibly tight and people are going to bang their heads sooner or later. Yeah. Um, and I, I wonder if some of that comes from your radio time as well. Yeah, I, 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 um, I, it's, um, it's partly that and partly with working with in very small theatres with very small budgets. Yeah. When you had to suggest, um, um, one of my one of the amazing ways I, I know of making plays bigger is by creating off-stage characters. There's one in this called Ray Duffy, mm -hmm. who's a marvelous trade union leader who's never seen, but is nonetheless a threat uh, to one of the protagonists in the play, Keith. And he and Ray Duffy have these extraordinary punch-ups <laughs> off stage. But you, you know, we're left to create Ray. Some of my best characters are off stage. Martin Cook. <laughs> There's two of them. There's yeah. several of them. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, now, uh, questions from you, please. And um, sort of, you know, wave your arm about a bit and um, attract attention. And... Um, so that we can see you. And, um, and, and obviously, if you can speak up, so, so much the better for everybody else. Yes, somebody. Th this play was uh, uh, performed some decades ago at the National. Um, how much has the play changed in terms of uh, how it's stylized, how it's put on, to fit with the, uh, the theatre arrangements here at Chichester compared to what you'd like to imagine? Uh, it's, its set is, is very original and uh, it's beautifully designed for that space, but the play itself is very much the same. Um, 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 I, I, I think the only such wood. I mean, the only difference between this and the National is that the boat's still floating. Um, um, uh, we had an absolutely disastrous time at the National. We did it in a tiny theatre in Scarborough, which is a stage area about this size, um, and it is in the round. And we built a tank, and we put a boat in it, and it moved, and uh, we, you know, it worked. Um, but it, it wasn't without its problems, but nonetheless, it was new technology. But the National, um, in their wisdom, built a fiberglass tank and proceeded to fill it with several thousand gallons of water, at which point the tank split like the Red Sea asunder uh, and cracked from one end to the other, and water poured through the Littleton stage uh, below. And... Uh, began to flood the main switch room of the National, at which point there were big polythene tr trunking was pouring the water back into the Thames. Um, and we couldn't do the show. And I kept cancelling preview after preview. Um, and then when we got, the, we got the tank right, then the banks wouldn't move. Uh, and then eventually um, we did get it right. But it, was, it became notorious. Um, and... Um, became a sort of joke, and people came along to see. And I think the play rather got lost. Um, uh, because Cable said, oh, well, I saw the first 25 minutes, and then the boat stuck. Um, and, it, uh, you know, it gave up. And uh, Peter Hall rang me, and he was the gaffer at the National at the time, and he said, Alan, not only can we not do your play in the, at the Littleton Theatre, we cannot do any play. In the <laughs> And uh, I, I put the entire national out of business. Um, and um, 
There was one Saturday night when we, I cancelled the matinee and the evening show because there was no way it was going to be technically possible. So they closed the Littleton Theatre and the Olivier was doing a technical rehearsal, so that wasn't open. And the, the, the whole of the South Bank, except for the Cottesloe, which was that tiny thing on the end there, all went dark. And uh, we were sitting in the completely empty foyer, all the front of house staff had gone home, and I thought, God, I've closed this entire complex. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was just a nightmare. Uh, but uh, it was interesting. I've got to say, Alan was our secret weapon, though, because with Ben's stone's design is extraordinary and beautiful, but really very early on, uh, you were in email contact and he got all the advice from Alan in the mathematics of it and mm. physics of it. And, uh, and so it's worked because of that collaboration, actually, and the lessons learned and um, had certain people listen to Alan in the first place, some of those things that happened at the National Theatre wouldn't have happened. So no. it isn't that technology's particularly changed, it's... It's that you know communication, and it's so, and it's it's an infamous story, but it's also a much loved story because at the national, where I'm based, everybody knows it. Everybody's <laughs> curious and is coming up, and somebody Eric Lumsden, who's now head of stage management at the national, was just a young um, ASM at the time um, in Scarborough, and then at the national, and had photographs of himself on the boat and. And, you know, so people have a lot of nostalgia and love for the original mm. production as well. So, mm. yeah. It, it, um, it allowed critics to draw attention to themselves. And critics yes, love as that. Yes, they love Critics that. do like that. They love yeah. that so Jack Tinker of The Daily Mail, the late Jack Tinker, turned up in Wellington Boots. <laughs> and the press night finally came along. Yes, another question, please. Did everybody hear that? Alan's being asked about the difference between television uh, performances of his plays and... and theatre performances, given that on television there's no interaction with a live audience? Well, I, th I, I have sort of mixed feelings, really. Um, and it's the same with the streamings that are being done at the moment. They streamed... Um, uh, this is live broadcast from the theatre, the National Theatre for, for a Small Family Business, which happened to me. And I saw that in Scarborough on a screen. Um, and um, I think it's a strange feeling... Um, if you haven't seen the play, you will probably get quite a lot from it. But if you have seen the play, you'll, you'll get a feeling of great loss because there is a sort of sense that my work especially, and I think most plays that are written worth their salt for theatre, um, rely on the interaction of the performer with the audience. And there is a liveness that somehow disappears from the play once you pre-record it for television. Um, and, it, and, you know, it still works, but you, you don't share it. Um, and I've always believed that uh, theatre for me is, is, is to, to, to coin the old cliché, a shared experience between the actors and the audience. And those are the two vital elements that mm. really matter. Um, and once you take the liveness away from that... Um, and I know the actors at the National, I talked to some of them when they did Small Family Business, the transmission, which, um, and they were radio mic'd like we were, uh, but they, so that they could be picked up by cameras. And, and they, they, were, they were in a sort of quandary. They didn't know whether they were playing for a camera, which was a few feet away, or the audience that were in the auditorium. Um, and so they got into an awful... I think one or two of them said that it was a horrible experience. I mean, they, they didn't really enjoy it. Uh, because an, an actor in front of a live audience at least knows these are the people I want to engage. But when there is a camera standing between you and the audience, then there's something different. And acting for the camera, or do you act for the audience? And when they're both there in the same room, it's very difficult to, to divide your loyalties like, like that. It's a bit like a sporting event in one way, except you don't get replays in the... Um... <laughs> what did he do there? I don't, I'm, I'm a bit big advocate for NT Live. I think mm. it's a really important tool in getting theatre out to communities and, and places that wouldn't see a play uh, that's in London or whatever. But absolutely, there's nothing that can replace the psychological and uh, effect of being in a shared experience live because I, the, the psychologists now actually trying to measure 
the things that happen to us when we watch mm. something live and there's with a screen or television or anything with uh, there isn't that um we don't transmit the same endorphins mm. and it's not as therapeutic so i think there's something very scientific about that experience as well oh gosh that sounds good yeah yeah yeah, yeah some... <laughs> somebody else somebody else Yes. yes. Um, can you give us an insight into uh, the dynamic between uh, the director and the playwright? An insight? Well, yes. Um, well, actually, Alan, you should give an insight to <laughs> the relationship between the yes. director and the playwright as you well, direct I, your own plays. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I mean, um, I... I started as a writer, and uh, then I started as a director, and I started off directing other people's work because I wasn't allowed to direct my own plays, apart from Scarborough, because they didn't think it was right. You know, the writers are not allowed to direct. So I developed two careers, and then suddenly they merged. Um, and these days, um, I don't know where one starts and the other finishes. Um, I am writing, and at the same time, I'm directing, and then I... I tend to try and leave the writer behind me when I go into the rehearsal room because it's a bit off-putting for the actors if, if they have a guy who potentially knows every single answer. So you, you, you try and you know, sort of shield that side off because obviously you, know, you, you, want, you want the actors to input uh, and to add their own contribution to the show. So I, I tend to divide myself, but the, the director is... is I. Th I I worked on a, on, on a, under a man called Stephen Joseph, who was a remarkable pioneer of theatre. And he, he, always, he always claimed that um, theatre was, was a, what I've just been saying, was essentially actors and audience, and everybody else was completely irrelevant. Um, and um, so, so writers were fairly important to, to, to at least provide the actors with some basic material. But he couldn't see any point in directors and he couldn't see any point in designers. Um, um, and uh, he, he was quite, quite extreme in that sense. But I know what he meant, that in fact, you know, uh, um, if, if you can, in a perfect world, get the script through the actors to the audience in one, that's fine. And that's how it should be. Sometimes somebody like Nadia needs to organise it a little bit and call the shots uh, because actors are not known to agree on everything. Uh, and somebody has to arbitrate and say, uh, well, I think uh, Mary's right in this particular instance, John, but um, you're, you're nonetheless, John, you, you were right at the beginning of the play um, and Mary, is, Mary was wrong. Uh, <laughs> So, um, and, and maybe, uh, maybe we could all try it a different way. Uh, so, um, yeah, but it, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting, for me, it's not a question I can really answer. I've just no. merged. I mean, one, you, you, you never tell an actor how to say a line, do you? I mean, the one person who absolutely might know how to say a line, but you never say that. Um, um, Nadia, what's your relationship if you have a writer in the room, so it to really speak? It really depends on the play and, and the writer. Uh, I... If it's a new play, sometimes the experience is a lot more full on. You have lots more time together and you're constantly cutting or changing with certain writers right up to the last minute. Like just doing Dara, we cut 40 minutes in the first preview, over the first three or four previews and we're changing things on opening night. You know, it's, it's nail biting stuff sometimes. But it really depends on the collaboration and the two people and... Um, yeah, I mean, I've had lots of different experiences. I've only had one experience where I've directed something that I've put together myself. Um, I wouldn't call myself a writer because it was verbatim and um, 80, 70 to 80 percent uh, found, you know, recorded words that I transcribed. And then so but I but I being a director, I, I love the job. But at some point, it's um, quite a lonely thing. You've got to sort of. Be except that it there needs to be a kind of separation at a certain point, or for me, and then and so when you have a writer, sometimes that can be quite nice to have a collaborator, second pair of eyes and ears on on a piece of work. So that's quite nice. And the letting go moment for you, Alan, is actually quite depressing, isn't it? You go into a bit of a trough afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tend to try and keep away from other people working on it because, you know, I, I sort of sit there and. Um, the, 
I, I don't, but they sometimes think, oh my God, this guy's done it three or four times before, must know, and he's just waiting for me to make a mistake, you know, which isn't true at all. But um, uh, because I have done it, and I am a director, really, um, I, try, I try to keep well clear. Um, but um, no, but yes, it is hard. Um, it's, it's a joy to go into a rehearsal room on day one with your new play under your arm and you've got a group of like-minded people who want to do their best with it. And then you work through and hopefully it's a joyous rehearsal experience and then it, it becomes a bit more hairy during technical time and then you get the previews and you, you begin to get the audience's reaction and hopefully it's good. And uh, suddenly, you're, um, you're, you're like a way upstream person. You jump ashore and let the craft go on. And um, they, they, they are, the actors are going, bye. Are you stopping now? We're going to miss you. And you say, yeah, I'm going to miss you too. <laughs> it's very, yeah, it's very intense making plays. It's, you know, you go from naught to 60 very quickly in relationships and, you know, talking about emotions and all. Dean, it's very full on. You kind of fall in love every time. Um, and then you, it gets a bit easy, but I find it difficult too. I, I, it's always hard to say goodbye to a piece of work and know that it will come to an end. That's but yeah. don't you find with, 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 with actors that you, you, you see them five years later when you've had the most wonderful experience with them and you say, do you remember Mary? And they say, what? And you say, <laughs> Mary, we created her together. Do you remember? And you say, oh yeah, that. And you know, they're, they're, they're faithless. They just move on. They're on yeah. to somebody else's character somewhere. The, the, the That's only, actors for The you. only solution is to write another play, of course. Yes. Yeah. yes. yes. Ladies and we're out of time, but thank you all very, very much for coming. Alan April and Nadia Fall, thank you both thank very you. much indeed. Thank you.